that you can't pull this off, right? Hey, you talking to the doctor. I need a doctor. Well, oh, oh. Oh, 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 Welcome, welcome, welcome again. Uh, it's Doc P, uh, Doc for the Streets. Again, new edition. Um, I have my esteemed colleague, friend, guest, Dr. Nicole Williams, who is uh, not only my partner in uh, gynecology in our practice called Gynecology Institute of Chicago, but also my friend, uh, my close friend, and we are going to entertain you and talk about some very interesting topics, not only with just gynecology, but uh, things that are impacting our world and our universe around us, um, hopefully give you some information. As always, Doc for the Streets is aimed at eradicating healthcare disparities and also uh, entertaining you at the same time. So um, without further ado, Dr. Williams. Hi, Pierre. How you doing? I am well in yourself. I am phenomenal. So let's see. I am phenomenal. So uh, just funny story, like just how we met. Um, so it was about, I would say maybe seven, eight years ago, somewhere in that, that realm. And I um, uh, was just finishing up residency and me uh, and a couple of my friends, we were um, out just, uh, you know, we are, were at this, this seminar um, for gynecology um, specialty for surgery. Uh, and we just so happened to meet this young lady there who was uh, quite ambitious and at the time was talking about starting a practice. Um, and so happens she was in Chicago. Um, and uh, at the time, you know, we had looked at her like, what? Like, you just about to jump out of residency and just like, just start your own practice, huh? Like, it's that easy. Like, you just going to go ahead and do it. And sure as shit. I mean, she just, uh, she said it and I thought she was crazy at the time. And uh, when I got back to Chicago, she followed true to her word. And literally, she, um, I have so much respect for her um, for everything that she's doing because she started from nothing. She had a dream about uh, what she wanted to do. She didn't want to be under anybody else's thumb um, and said she was going to go out on the limb, eat ramen, do whatever it took to uh, to make it happen. And she jumped off, created her own practice and is doing extremely well. Um, and so I said, hey, um, you know, I, I, I like that model. I like that concept. Why don't we do this together? Hmm. Good idea. Absolutely. <laughs> so it was really funny. I was just thinking about that. So when we were at the seminars with my ship Tracy mm -hmm. and I was, I was like, oh my God, men, <laughs> what? <laughs> and there was this young brother had on a Gucci belt about this big. <laughs> so she's trying to put me out It's there. It was this big. And that was the first thing I saw. I was like, oh, hmm. What is he doing here? So she's very judgmental. She's very judgmental. But that's okay. We we got over those hurdles. But then I got to know you. I was like, oh, you know what? He's really trying to do something. I was like, you know what? Let me help a young brother out. You came to Mercy. Well, you were in Decatur. And I think I was down there for some training. Mm -hmm. And then, Assessor. right, Assessor. Assessor. Assessor training. Yeah. And then you came to Chicago. You were at Mercy. I was still, was I still at Mercy or no? I was out. I had already started the yeah, practice. You started. Yeah. And I was trying to get you to do the stuff with Project Exploration, but yeah, I didn't know you already had this other thing going, so that's wonderful. And whose idea was it? What uh, team up? I mean, we had talked about it. We had talked about it early, but we just never, you know, you had. I, I'd had like my kids were younger, and I was like, I can't do yeah. it right now. You you were free as a bird, and you said I'm just gonna go ahead and bet on myself. And I was like, Hey, I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna be a, <laughs> a chili to watch, watch you do me it. Suffer. But she uh, she made it happen. Um, and that was, that's that's just <sighs> enough on that. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of uh -oh. things. Uh, so um, at our practice, uh, Gynecology Institute of Chicago. Um, Dr. Williams has made a niche of 
dealing with sexual dysfunction. And I've, I'm also uh, very much so, uh, you know, concerned with uh, not only uh, making sure that, well, well, first off, let me back up a little bit. So uh, women think that um, not having an orgasm, some women think that that is okay and think that it's, you know, it's, you can go through life and not have it. But what you don't understand is that an orgasmia is a true diagnosis. Like it is not um, something that is normal for you to go through life without orgasm. And both of us, we, you know, we treat uh, women every day that either complain of a uh, not having orgasms or b faking it just so they can, you know, kind of feed egos of their partner. So we have both, you know, had, you know, just looked into this, uh, this problem and try to find ways to eradicate it. Um, and there are some very um, tried and true treatments of fixing anorgasmia. And so what, what did you bring over there in that bag? Oh, we're going right to the stuff? Why not? Why oh, I it? thought we were gonna, you know, kind of, you know, dance around that well, topic around, for talk, a bit. Talk about it. Let's, let's talk about it. What you, what you want to talk uh, about? Uh, so when um, there's the concept of the orgasm gap, uh, meaning most women, you're right, will either fake it or just not and be fine with life and. What's funny to me is that when I'm talking with my patients about it, they they don't even mention it in the visit until I mention it mm -hmm. as an issue. And I go, you know, any issues with sex? And they're like, oh my God, let me tell you all about this thing. And oh my goodness, and this isn't working and this, that. And I'll go, whoa. And that happens 70% of the time. Mm -hmm. Kid you not. Mm -hmm. And so I talk to my patients about Self-stimulation. Mm -hmm. So my soror back in the Clinton administration actually advocated for this and you know, she lost her job for that. Mm. Yeah. Um, anyway, so what I'm wearing right now, can you see this? This is the easiest one. So you kind of go with what you know. Now this is super slick. Y'all gotta yeah. check this thing out. Well, you go with, first thing you do is your hand is the, the easiest thing to do. And I always ask my patients, do you masturbate? Do you know how to masturbate? Can you bring yourself to orgasm all by yourself, nobody else around? And most of the patients can say, yeah, 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 sure they can. And I go, okay, well then, when you are with your partner, put a hand down there. Hands are free. Facts. If that's not working, then you have to get you know, a little creative with things that are, if you've never had an orgasm on your own, you cannot bring yourself to orgasm all by yourself, then you need a little bit of help. So yes, this is the fancy feast, but we'll start with basics here. So this is what we have in our office. I don't, I don't want to make it so that my patients feel intimidated mm -hmm. by bringing themselves sexual pleasure because that's look, life sucks in a whole lot of other ways. So may as well have a good orgasm. And so I tell patients all the time like this, like literally you can't like, and when women talk about, you know, they are either a not experiencing orgasms or B have to fake it. Like the, the biggest thing that I see is there's a communication gap, right? So for women, you know, a lot of women think that they know men completely. Right. And with the inverse of that men think they know women in their entirety. So I spend my entire day listening to women talk about how men don't know anything and, and bashing men. And then I spend the other half of my life around men to say, oh, I did this and I just, man, you should have been there. Like, I, you know, and if you could have filmed it, oh my God, you know? And it's like, it's, and somebody's lying and there's a disconnect because if not, I wouldn't have these problems that I deal with with women every day. So the biggest thing is communication. So it's so taboo uh, between men and women to actually discuss sex and discuss pleasurable sex. Um, and, you know, if I tell him this, then, you know, he may feel insecure or what have you. And then, or if, if he talks about, you know, if he, he talks about her and she'll say, well, you know, are you not pleased? You're not satisfied. But if everybody is mature and they have conversations about these things, there will be a gap this bridge. And that's what I'm trying to do. Like I just started a clubhouse that's talking about, let's talk about sex. That's really opening up to allow men and women to actually openly talk about 
the issues of sex and to really learn anatomy because, you know, one of the biggest things like most men don't even know what a clitoris is. Like they just don't. It's just like this mythical thing that it is completely obsolete to them. Right. So, you know, having these conversations about it, um, especially with women and letting women understand that if you can't please yourself, you can't really teach anyone else how to please you. So like that is one of the biggest things that, you know, myself and um, Dr. Williams are, are really trying to show women and it's OK. Like talk about it and learn about yourself a little bit. And, you know, it's interesting, Pierre, is that. Many of my patients expect the man to somehow give them these mind-blowing orgasms, like they have some special knowledge. And I think, to, well, nobody knows unless you can do it yourself. But I'm going to posit to you that that is a societal issue. Because when you watch porn or you watch any, even if you watch kind of female-centered like Lifetime movies or anything like that, the man always comes and he sweeps the woman off her feet and he just knows exactly what to give her. But the, the, Greatest joy ever. And <sighs> that's just not Everybody, real life. And that's, and that's another big thing. Like, like most men feel that like, you know, one woman, it, you know, is all women. Like, it's just, everybody's just built the same. And it's not. I mean, you have like women that are stimulated clitorally, some that have vaginal orgasm, some that need both, you know, some that, you know, just need, you know, complete foreplay and other stimulation like it's every they're different. You know, women are different, just like, you know, car shoes and anything else like people are different. So um, it takes conversation. It takes uh, understanding. And it also takes the actual woman to understand herself, because if she does not understand herself, then she cannot expect, you know, her partner or another man to do it. Exactly here. That's where we as gynecologists can educate our patients because, you know, we're not going to be able to be there and tell the dude what to do. But we can arm our patients with the knowledge that they understand their bodies. They can bring their own body's pleasure. And then like, oh, here, there is a man. This is what you should do to make me happy. Oh, here's our clitoris. Hmm. I actually have this That's in the office. Model, this is a clitoral model. And the way that it actually goes, I have to use, I guess I could use, my, I always use my right hand when I do clitoris. So it looks like this, hmm. actually in a female, right? So if this is the clit right here, and this is gonna be your G-spot. Ta-da, there's your G-spot, which I really, really like to tell, talk to people about because the G-spot is actually a real thing. So Dr. Grafenberg, was a urologist who found out that if you take a finger and you do this kind of come hither motion Absolutely. right here, this is intensely pleasurable. And I remember you're talking to um, about your clubhouse about squirting and all that kind of stuff. Pants. All right, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, see, I have my clitoris right here, like doing the whole thing. Yo. All right, so we, you know. Uh, outside of this, we are going to definitely have conversations about vaginal anatomy and spots and erogenous zones and all of those things. Like, it's just these are foreign conversations to me. Yes. And we need to have open dialogue about these things, really. Um, there's an article that I just read about um, Dakota Johnson, who is the uh, Fifty Shades of Grey lady, the daughter of Don Johnson for, you know, older viewers. And she's starting this company that's basically trying to eradicate uh, the 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 term toy or sex toy and make it so that there are terms that show that it's a necessity and not something that is taboo. Um, and I think that, you know, that's very important because the taboo nature of, you know, toys is why people really don't buy them. But um, toys actually help sex, make sex better. I call it a dildo. Call a thing what it is. A dildo is a dildo is a dildo. When, and no offense to Dakota Johnson, but I think there are other things that she could be doing with her time than advocating against the use. I'm advocating for the proper use of words. So if I am engaged in sex and I've, there's something else that is going to be fun, that is going to be useful for me, what shall I call it? An instrument? Mm -hmm. Sure, you could call it an instrument. However, wouldn't it just make more sense to just call it a toy? It's a sex toy, Pierre. Well, see, the problem is, it's like when you talk about men with fragile egos, that when you start talking about you need toys or you need all of these other things, you're like, wait a minute, hold on a second. 
What do you mean? Why do you need that? You don't. But what do you mean? I'm, adds, I'm enough. But it just adds to the whole experience. Look, if but, you've been wait. screwing the same person for all this time, you kind of, you know, just something else. you mean else. to tell me my dick's not enough? No. Nah. What are you talking about? <laughs> you can't have that conversation. I know. Like, you gotta, it's you it's really tough. You got to break that down a little bit. It's That's, tough. But you know, it's you just gotta, about you gotta enhancement. You got to use these words. Is, is the male ego is a fragile thing. It it's is an a fragile thing. You have to see. Like, what are like? No, oh, just use it. Just. And meanwhile, while you're throwing all of these little devices and toys, you just, uh, uh. Uh, just crushing ego left, right, left, right, left, right. So it's like you got you got to sue, you got to ease in. Just like you know, sometimes like you know, women don't want to hear certain things. A man doesn't. A man doesn't want to hear like he needs more to please his woman. So you got to have like some of these little cold words and things to kind of offset them a little bit. Okay, so that's something that can be, you know, introduced. Over time, you know, mm. one thing at a time. Oh, by the way, I have a pair of handcuffs. Oh, by the way, you know, just little things. You just got to go with the butt plug right away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, listen, I'm going to tell y'all women something. Seriously, you know, because some of y'all get these ideas like men are okay with some of this crazy stuff. Like, don't sneak things to your man's anus like you cannot like especially not me like seriously real talk watch your fingers like we're not cool with these toys in by the anus there is a zone of no return it is a zone of no return right now i am petrified i am i am <laughs> literally i am having a internal like Heart attack. I don't have a every butt plug I in my bag, Pierre. It's really every okay. Every time I think about this dreaded prostate exam that I get, I'm about to get. Like, I am trying to find, I got one, like, Asian, little small Asian uh, primary care physician lady that I've been talking to for an entire year about this dreaded prostate exam I have. Like, my, my physician, he has these huge meat hands. Mm -mm, we're not doing that. We ain't going to do that. No, 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 no. So I'm saying all that to say that watch your man and his anus. It is a sacred thing. Do not try to slip anything or try to tell him, oh, it might be a good idea. If I, mm -mm, it's just not okay. You never know. Mm -mm, just saying. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Just I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's just there. Just okay. Anyway. Okay. Back to the task at hand with our female patients. Maybe it's something that they could kind of introduce. That's all I mean is just introduce things, you know, in their relationship, especially if she remains unsatisfied because women are so accustomed to just being unsatisfied at baseline and being okay with it in life. And I tell them all the time, no, you, this should be, this is an incredibly important part of life and you should experience it to the nth degree. And if you are not, then we need to do something about it. And that's why I have my little bag of things. Anyway, we have that in our office and I talk about each individual item because I need, I want people to feel at home. So whether there it's a toy or whether it's an instrument or whether it's just a straight up dildo, then fine. But I want to normalize it. And that's why I have it in a doctor's office. Because when they see that, then they feel a little bit more compelled to buy it than having to go to the sex shop. So what do you tell like your patients that are, you know, that are not, um, you know, they don't really enjoy penetration, that they're more clitoral stimulator? Like, what do you say to those? Patients? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do have patients who suffer with a condition called, you know, they used to call it vaginismus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, you know, it was called the clinching syndrome or the cold fish or all these other terrible monikers they would put to it. But all it is is just the muscles around the vagina. So if this is a vagina, I'm going to have to use my left hand now. I'm having to learn how to do that. <laughs> these are the muscles of the vagina. I actually show people, like, because it actually looks just like this. And if these muscles are too tight and they're trying to get in someplace, right. then ouch. And because you're, you're just, everything right. is clenched and nothing is going to be able to get in. Right. But what I do is we either inject this with a really mild steroid, like a catalog, something that's like, a very mild steroid, by the way. Mm -hmm. I know people are like, oh my God, injections. But we do that. They do the same thing for necks, knees, tennis, elbow, backs, same stuff. And it actually works incredibly well. We do that, then a little physical therapy, and then you toss in a dildo, but a little one, just to get started. Something you can just kind of get in there, let it sit. 
Or a, vag- watch an episode. or a vaginal dilator, as the right. physical therapist would like to go. Vaginal yeah. floor physical therapist. Would or like a tiny dildo. Right. <laughs> yeah. So start with a tiny dildo. Let it sit there. You know, watch an episode of something. Because once your vaginal muscles learn to relax, then absolutely you can get to penetration. Now, if the patient still doesn't enjoy penetration, because many women do not have orgasm with penetrative sex. And that's why I tell them, guess what? You can put a hand down there. Don't wait for your man to give you anything. Because if you're waiting on some man to give you something, you're just waiting on Jesus. So you should actually get what you want yourself. And shame on me. Does that make me selfish? But (laughs) I think that we as women have just put up with so much crap that we should have a really great orgasm. I agree. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Pierre. So our our um, our practice is called the Gynecology Institute of Chicago. And the reason is, is because we have stopped seeing OB patients. Like we are strictly focused on gynecology. And I hear all the time, like, how in the world can you stop that? Why don't you just enjoy delivering babies? Like, why is this just not the thing? Like, what is the problem? What have you? And to them, I say that in Chicago, there's... Or in Illinois, um, I try to teach people about, you know, medicine and things all the time. And um, one of the biggest things is something called tort reform. And so tort reform is when uh, you have a cap on litigation, right? So if something happens, uh, whether it be any medical malpractice uh, suit, that you have a cap. Usually that cap is $250,000. Well, guess what? In a majority of the country... Uh, it, it tort reform is very regular in Illinois. It's not. So if something happens, instead of there being a cap, you can sue for however much they will give you. So uh, talk to that. Talk about that a little bit. Oi, really? <laughs> okay. So um, that's the entire reason why I stopped delivering babies. In fact, I would love to continue to deliver, but it just came down to math. The math is this. I needed to deliver... Let's see. Can I tell people how much we get per baby? Absolutely. It really depends. It depends anywhere between like $1,500 to $3,000, depending on the insurance. So I would need to deliver. Just say like life is really great. You get three grand per baby and that's a C-section, right? Mm-hmm. So you need to deliver three, six, nine, 12, 15. Mm-hmm. I need to deliver at least five babies a month in order to reach my break-even point with my mal- malpractice insurance. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if... I cannot do that. And I'm downtown Chicago. Not a whole lot of people are becoming pregnant. Then I'm stuck in a hole trying to pay the malpractice for the few patients. And I I would love to deliver some of my patients because I really love them. I really want to be there for that really special time for them. However, it's just not tenable. And so you have to make a choice in Illinois if you want to stay in Illinois. And when I did, my malpractice insurance went from, oh, $120,000 down to somewhere in like the $30,000 range in the course of a few years, which has really allowed me to be able to practice because there's no way I could practice otherwise. And so that's, you know, and that's what, what people don't really understand. It's just like, it's, No matter how, you know, how much we want to help or how much we want to be of service to our patients, you know, we have families and stuff, too, at the end of the day. So it's like if you are working, 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 working to just pay insurance just to help people, like you have to X that out. Mm. And I I personally, you know, I like obstetrics. I like delivering children. Um, I don't like to do too much of it, but. Um, I don't mind it. I still do it because I take calls in the hospital. But from a private practice perspective, it's like, you know, if you and especially if you take care of patients that don't have commercial insurance, you can sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice and you can like get up and move and do these things and take calls and do all of these things. And at the end of the day, you can impact your own livelihood because you're helping somebody that is going to sue you at the end of the day. And if you get sued in Illinois with an OB case and you get, you know, a three, four, five million dollar um, lawsuit, you know, that you lose. Ooh, screwed. Five. Screwed. Yeah, so that's, the, that's the biggest thing to that. So, you know, I am very empathetic when it comes to, uh, you know, the statistics about, um, you know, black maternal deaths. You know, I've, I've made a point to try to, you know, alleviate, you know, those things and try to, you know, be a vessel to, uh, 
uh, to eradicate, you know, healthcare disparities from a black maternal, um, you know, health standpoint. Uh, but again, like we really, you know, people really have to start pushing politicians because uh, I personally feel that this is a big money grab. Right. So there's no, you know, the if anybody knows the politics in Illinois, like it is it is what it is. It just is that it's it's a money grab. So insurances are to gain from no tort reform. So as long as and politicians also gain from that. So as long as that's in place, then there's absolutely no reason to protect physicians and actually help patients because that's what it's going to do. It'll help patients at the end of the day, but they don't have to do that because if you have doctors that have to pay, you know, 10,000 plus in insurance per month and, you know, you're paying insurance and you got lobbyists that are paying, you know, politicians and all, you got all this whole system going and things don't really necessarily have to change. But if yeah. the people make the change and the people really understand what's going on, then you all can start to push your politicians to make changes. So, um, yeah, that's right. that's definitely that. Yeah, it'd be really wonderful to keep OB physicians in Illinois, especially because, um, so I was working with, not working with, so I would go to ACOG and do a lot of stuff on Capitol Hill and do my lobbying efforts for the Mama Act, which actually just ended up making it into, for some strange reason, it made it into the legislation that just came out for the, the new act. So it's it's kind of exciting because now we are going to be able to expand Medicaid to 12 months postpartum. Mm -hmm. And you know that a lot of times when you would deliver a patient and then she come in for the six week postpartum visit, like how often did she really make it? What if she had her blood pressure issue? What if she was going to have a pulmonary embolism that would kill her? She didn't. Or what if she just couldn't get to that six week postpartum visit after that? she had no insurance, she couldn't seek any help. So now in the state of Illinois, and it's been mandated by the federal government that Medicaid is now going to cover postpartum care for one entire year. So at least those women who are doing that, I figured if I wasn't going to do OB, at least I can advocate for that. Mm. So um, the, the other thing that we are very passionate about, extremely passionate about is fibroids me and nicole are extremely passionate about it myself the self-proclaimed fibroid slayer um and <laughs> eradicator of fibroids um you know it's 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 a lot like it's you know it's 80 percent of african-american women have fibroids you know real talk and um and what i try to explain to people and people freak out when they hear the word fibroid but um realize that it's very prevalent and uh, the biggest thing that we are concerned about is, is two components of fibroids. One, size, two, locations, all right? So you can have a huge fibroid um, that is nowhere near as uh, problematic as a very, very small one that's inside the cavity. So understanding fibroids, but more importantly, understanding your options to treat fibroids is huge like and when you when it comes down to um you know your treatment options and nothing i don't think pains us more um either nicole or myself is like just walking around or not walking around but seeing patients that have these extremely just morbid scars and have had horrible stories about hysterectomies and myomectomies that uh, probably necessarily didn't necessarily need to be done. I mean, it's just, it's just a travesty. It is. But when it comes to fibroids, I'm a tertiary referral center. So by the time I get to a patient, they're already this big. Mm -hmm. We need to have other physicians and even patients start telling patients, we need to treat fibroids like cancer. Because if you see cancer, what do you do with it? You do something about it Absolutely. when you see it there. So, so a lot of my patients say, well, my doctor told me I had a fibroid, but they said it wasn't that big of a deal. And then two years later, two years later, they have this. It's this big ass thing right there. And then what do you do at that point? Another thing. So that's one big issue. So one big issue is 
People aren't treating fibroids appropriately. They're letting them sit and fester and get big. The second thing is patients try to self-treat without a physician's care. And I'm going to call out some of these um, internet people who talk about, oh, well, if you go vegan and you put these packs on, or if you, um, what's this other thing that they like, castor oil or, um, oh God, what's that other stuff that they like to do? Come on, come on, come on. Anyway, they try to do all these other things and they'll try these things for years. And what are those fibroids doing? Growing. They're growing. Listen, let me tell y'all something. So, and I'll tell, I'll tell people this all the time. Like, if you look at history, right, you know, we, you know, anybody that's 30, 35 plus, right, on to the 70s or 80s, if you look at it, like, through our history, there's always, if somebody is going to pay for it, then somebody will try to push you to, to buy it, right? So, if you have something that is, like, it is too good to be true, a lot of the times probably it is, is right. So, you know, and I don't, I don't knock herbalist. I don't knock nutritionist because people have a misconception that as doctors that we're trying to push medicines, right? Like I go in and just say, Hey, you need this medicine to fix this, or you need this medicine to fix that. Uh, as a doctor, I, every single patient, I don't care if they're skinny. I don't care if they run marathons. I don't care if they're 400 pounds. I am encouraging healthy lifestyle. I am encouraging Proper diet, exercise, diet, exercise, diet, exercise, living a healthy life. I'm always encouraging that. I live by that example. So I don't tell my patients to do anything that I'm not doing myself, right? So I meal prep, I exercise, I do these things. So we're not telling patients that to not do that. However, realize that even if you do that, bad things can still happen. So people that still, you know, that are eating great diets and are, um, you know, are exercising are still getting cancers. You're still getting fibroids. You're still getting these things. It's still going to happen. That's why care is important. With that being said, the fear of fibroids in particular is something to capitalize on. So you have a lot of people that'll say, I I, I came, I had a, a patient come in with these fibroid blaster pills, right? No. And just say, oh, I swear. No. I can't make this up. She has some pills like, what do you think about these pills? Like, would it be okay if I take these? And literally it had fibroid blaster on it. And it just had a bunch of just like tea herbs and stuff. Any like, vitamins or uh, anything? Just like, like it just had a bunch iron. of stuff. Yes, it's just just regular stuff in it, okay. like that you probably could get yeah. with your um, multivitamin. Your multivitamin, but because I put fibroid blaster on it now, thirty four ninety five, thirty forty fifty dollars a month for this pill. If you look at our history, like remember when we was kids, like they had noni juice. Oh, yes, right? yes. So, remember, noni juice was like supposed to cure you, supposed to all your joints, your ailments, everything supposed to go away with noni juice. Anybody ever talk about noni juice? Anymore? Nope. And you go a little bit further, we had ginkgo biloba. Ginkgo biloba. Was oh, that was supposed to cure everything. Your, anybody talk about that anymore? And then you go back, echinacea. Echinacea is supposed to stop you from getting cold, stop you from getting fluids, all that stuff. We don't really talk about echinacea anymore. Now you got elderberry. Now you got... Sea moss. Sea moss is the new one, right? Really? So sea moss, they're going to ride sea moss out for about a good two and a half, three years. Sea moss capsules, sea moss drinks, sea moss pills, sea moss uh, rub, sea moss in your, in your, in your THC. Like it's going to be sea moss laced everything, right? They're going to market this to death, right? And so people just say, hey, you know what? My auntie died and she was taking sea moss every day. Right. Mm-hmm. And maybe sea moss doesn't have like as many benefits because sea moss is supposed to cure COVID. Yeah. So it's like just realize that it's a marketing scheme. If you're going to pay for it, then people are going to say, hey, you know, sea moss is, didn't just happen yesterday. Sea moss has been around for hundreds of years. So why all of a sudden in 2021 now this is the magical cure for COVID and for some of these modern day ailments? Just think people. Think, 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 please. Yeah. Or at least 
bring it to us. At least that patient did bring you this med or whatever this is and say, hey, I want to try that. Yeah. Because I have other patients who I haven't seen for years and they were trying these other things. And it's almost like they're a little bit embarrassed to talk to me about it. And I go, no, no, no. I would rather you tell me now, consider me your plumber or your priest, or maybe like a combination of the two, because if you tell me these things, then we can walk through this stuff together. Oh, here's my biggest pet peeve right now. Everybody's afraid of birth control pills because they don't want hormones. Right. Guess what? <laughs> your body, in your body right now, your Our ovaries hormones. are continuing to crank out estrogen, progesterone. It's just like they have estrogen, progesterone, estrogen, progesterone all day, every day. Like in the beginning of the month, estrogen, estrogen, estrogen. In the middle of the month, progesterone, 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 progesterone. progesterone. And this is every single month. And guess what? You're not growing out a third neck or any of these other things that you think the hormones are causing. Your body is producing these things. So birth control pills are synthetic versions of what your body already creates. It just basically is kind of tricking your body into thinking that it's there are already bad. high levels of these things when there really aren't. So the things like ovulation, pregnancy can be prevented. And that's all it is. But people are have these big misconceptions mm. about... We're going to blame, blame uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and that crew of incredibly rich people who want to say, oh, well, you all you have to do is do some yoga and burn some incense and all of these things. However, if your periods are actually irregular, if there is an actual issue, if there's hormone imbalance, if there's something else going on, then yeah, you probably need to override the system. Right. And we have medications to override the system. Right. And we don't have to do it forever. I tell my patients, like, we don't have to do it forever, but you should do it for at least three months, six months. Let's get things kind of back in order. That's why we have hormones. And my other thing is, technically, everybody should be pregnant. Half the population should be pregnant, breastfeeding, having a miscarriage, or something in between when it comes to reproduction. Mm -hmm. My, your great grandmother had like 12, 13 kids, right? So how often does she have periods all the time? People are so concerned about regulation of their periods. My periods are regular, periods are regular. Well, because you're supposed to be pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I explain that to them and they get all offended. And I go, <laughs> okay, well, let me explain. So in a natural fertility population, we're talking about Papua New Guinea or some of these other islands in the South Pacific where there are no people. Women were pregnant and they didn't have as many periods. So we're not supposed to be having these periods. So when I explain to them, actually, you're not supposed to be having these many periods. You're supposed to have, oh, one or two, three a year, maybe, because you will have had a baby, you will have breastfed that baby, and then you might have two periods before you get pregnant right away. Mm. And patients like, wow. And I'm like, yeah. And it's like, you know, it's, uh, I can hear this all the time. It's just like, in, in women's minds, there's a misconception that you just have to have a period. If you don't have a period, then you're just unclean or your body's going to uh, just biodegrade on you and you're just going to have, it's going to explode on you. And then, you know, one question I have to you, well, what happens to menopausal women that don't have periods anymore? Are they They're just going alive. to decay or die and fall apart? Absolutely not. Right. So do not, the only reason you need to have a regular period every single month is if you plan on getting pregnant. Yeah, that's it. If you do not plan on getting pregnant, that you you do not have to have a regular period. If there is a hormone, if your body is hormonally regulated and you don't have a period every month, it's going to be OK. Right. That Promise means if we're you. when we're, if we're overriding the system, if right. we're doing something that's going to help you be a little bit more free. Um, now, a lot of other women believe that, you know, that this is like a cleansing kind of thing. And I explained to them, that's just blood and tissue that your body doesn't need that month because you did not conceive that month. So your body's like, oh, OK, done. Mm. And it just goes away. It's not cleaning anything. Mm. It's just it's useless. And so it goes away. That's it. There is a lining. The lining of your uterus grows. It gets ready for the baby. So estrogen, it makes this lining very thick. It's like baby come, baby come, baby come. Egg is released. Waiting on a waiting on a sperm to come and fertilize it. That doesn't happen. So now you have this thick lining in the uh, of the uterus that's waiting. It never happens. Now the body breaks this down. That's where your period comes. It breaks this thick wall that's in the lining of your uterus because it was waiting on a pregnancy. The pregnancy doesn't happen. It breaks it down. 
Done. That's your period. Done. That's what your period happens. And guess what's going to happen next month? Same thing. It's going to build back up. It's going to wait for pregnancy to come. Pregnancy doesn't come. Right. Period. Over and over and over and over and over and cycle again. You don't have to have that if you don't intend on getting pregnant. In 2021, I continue to say this. There is no excuse for unintended pregnancies. Like our birth control at this point is so so good at it. It's so great. It's so it's so high tech that like you just if you want to get if you get pregnant is because you wanted to get pregnant. Like at this point. Oh, that's a whole other theory. Well, wait, 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 wait. back to the period thing. Oh, what was I wanted wanted to say about the whole period thing? Um, oh, we were talking about overriding the system. Oh, when? Oh, here's the thing about birth control that I wanted to let everybody know is that people are like, oh well, sometimes I'm on the pill and I don't get a period. Is that an issue? And I go, well, actually, that's the lining. It's so thin mm. now that there's just nothing in there for it to come out. Mm. And that's another thing that's so important for people to understand is that if your lining is thin, like I have an IUD, I spot for like a whole day and a half and I'm mad at that spot. <laughs> Truth. Um, but if there's no lining, then it's okay. Now, if you have an issue, if you don't, if you're not on birth control or anything, you're not having periods, then that's a whole other issue that you need to talk to me and Pierre about. Another issue that, I, that we had to talk about is like stop being neurotic about anything that is pos that could you think may be wrong with your vagina. Like discharge. No, we happens. want them. Discharge happens. We want them to come. Yeah, I get it. I get come it. Come on, but we'll it's talk like about it's it. like y'all are donating like at the point. It's just like, you know, if if you have discharge, like it does not necessarily have to be an infection. Don't think that metronidazole or uh, a diflucan pill is just going to fix the world, right? So, like, literally, like, think about it, right? So, we're talking about discharge. So, when you don't drink water, and if you're dehydrated, guess what's going to happen to your discharge? It's thick. It's going to be thick, right? You have to think about, like, your diet and your health and other things that you're doing in your in your life as far as like it's concerned. And I say this all the time. If it doesn't have an odor, if it's not irritating you and it's not a big issue, like it's not causing your body to feel funny, it's usually, not all the time, it's usually not an infection. An infection is going to bother you, right? It's going to give you some sign of symptoms that's going to be irritating. If it's not doing that, then just try drinking water. Heaven forbid, guess what? When men ejaculate inside of you, guess what? That's a base, right? It's going to stink a little bit. So how about you try not to do that? Like there are certain little things that you could do to stop the discharge from being that way. Oh, <laughs> Pierre, be it's nice. True. I'm just, you know, I just trying to tell the people, I'm trying to help. <laughs> I try to help people like because you guys come in here with these, you know, just I can't believe it. I'm having this discharge. I don't know. I'm going to kill them. I'm going to do this. You haven't drank water in like three days. Like you've been drinking soda and everything else. And it's just like you're doing it like, yo, just think about it before you do it. Well, that's a garbage in, garbage out situation. It's true. You cannot eat like crap. You cannot wear leggings, thongs, and then go to the gym and then go home and watch Netflix without cleaning and taking all that stuff off and then expect there to be nothing. Correct. And that's, and that's an education thing. And that's why we're here talking about this because there is so much misconception. And I'm going to go back to say that it is all about money because if on the cover of Cosmo every month, there's either something about sex or mm -hmm. something about your vagina or something about, you know, just, oh, how do we fix something that's wrong with a woman? Well, nine times out of 10, there's usually nothing wrong with you, but you have been told by society that there must be something wrong with you. Therefore, you spend money in order to fix it. Absolutely. And for like, for, for women, please, Please do not stick things in your vagina. Dude, just don't. All right. Don't stick your finger in there oh with water. God. Don't stick vinegar in your vagina. Like your vagina is a self-cleaning 
oven. oven. I love that Let one. I, I always say that all the time. Let it clean itself. Like, do not do not just stick things in there. I promise you, you're not fixing it. You're not helping. You're not helping. It's going to do what it does. It you does not this. need your help. You can do that. Okay, just, just by the that. way. Okay. <laughs> you can do that. Yes. But Clean when, your it toys. Comes to, when it comes to cleaning, all right, and that also includes penises, mm-hmm. right? right? So I understand the proverbial quickie is like great, but guess what? When you introduce bacteria into the vagina, like if he's been in boxers all day, guess what? There's bacteria down there. <laughs> so you need to have him wash. You need to wash. Like everybody needs to wash and be clean before you do that. Because once you implement bacteria into the vagina, then bad things can happen. Infection happens. You're disrupting the house. Disrupting the house. Okay, this is true. Very, very true. Okay. What else are we talking about, Pierre? Pray so, be tell. Let's stop talking about gynecology for us. Okay, like, yes, let's. Get a little bit more serious. So in our in 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 the current times, like, you know, guys, so I'm I am all about social justice i am all about like you know ending um you know unarmed black people getting brutalized uh by the police um i am against it i am totally just uh, i i have i think i've become an activist now i think i have i have spoke out enough to consider myself an activist but i was extremely um, I, I have an unpopular opinion uh, about the current topic. Um, you know, there's there was a young man um, in Chicago named Adam Toledo that a uh, 13 year old kid um, that they actually had video footage or camera footage that um, the police had shot and murdered this young man. Um, and the I believe that you know whenever a kid you know, a 13 year old kid is killed. There's a visceral reaction, right? There's always uh, a, an extreme reaction to it, to where it's like, you know, this is wrong. Somebody has to uh, be accountable for this. Um, but, and when I watched the video personally, um, I had, I did not have the immediate visceral reactions. Like I, I have looked at, you know, a multitude of, you know, uh, of these instances in the past you know when i when i saw philando castile i was a immediate visceral reaction right uh with george floyd immediate visceral reaction um uh, alton sterling immediate visceral reaction right but when i saw this particular case uh, i didn't feel that way um and then when i started to look at some of the details of this case where you had, you know, a 13 year old boy that was with a 21 year old kid uh, and they were out, you know, at two 30 in the morning. And uh, in Chicago, you have actual detection devices that are detecting um, gunshots. So they can, it's not like BBs or anything. They, they have, uh, you know, high tech uh, equipment that will, uh, verify when guns are being shot and those were activated um, in this case and when the when the police got to the scene uh, you know the 21 year old they got the 13 year old started to run um, and when he ran uh, simultaneously he dropped the gun at the end and he turned and then there were shots fired and for me um, I, I I feel that um, there were a multitude of things in which we should blame uh, for this happening. But at the end of the day, um, I am not feeling that the police are to blame for this. And I do not feel that that police officer who also, by the way, um, you know, he had a he had a very visceral reaction after it. You know, when we saw, you know, Alton Sterling, when we saw. Um, Philando Castile. When we saw um, George Floyd, we saw officers who had absolutely no emotion uh, for what they have done um, to try to help, um, you know, the victim. You know, here you could see an officer trying to help this kid, trying to save. It. Obviously, it's not going to happen. You got shot with a forty-five in the chest. It's not going to happen. But you know, this officer was also uh, very shaken um, after it. You can see him visibly shaken on the ground, crying um, after it happened. That does not. Uh, give me the impression of someone that was out trying to 
you know, uh, exhibit some racial bias uh, to it towards a kid. Uh, but you know, I, that that's my thoughts on it. What's what's your thoughts? Oi, oh Pierre. Um, to begin with, the system failed that kid. Not only did the Chicago Public Schools, then we're going to talk also about who else failed that kid. The fact that he may or may not have had his parents there at a reasonable time when I was 13. There's no out at 2.30 in the morning. It just didn't happen ever. It was a non-thing. Who else failed it? Yes, the police failed him because there are many other ways to stop a kid. Anybody. You don't have to aim here. So you have an argument with that though. So, because I. You have, can aim lower. Yeah, no, sorry, aim yeah, lower. Aim on the shoulder. You, There's I'll other you, places you, where you can why. shoot somebody and render them I, I have helpless. This, and I, I, used to, I used to have this same argument. And um, my, my best friend from high school is a Secret Service agent. And he talks about, he showed me like video footage of, you know, trying to do that and like trying to hit somebody in the leg or trying to hit somebody in the arm quick, fast like that. If you miss, right, you're, you're, you're always taught to hit center mass because, you know, you know, legs, one, you can miss two, um, you're not, you're not rendering them, um, helpless at that point. So you can hit somebody in the leg. They can still shoot and Are fire you, at you. Okay. They still shoot fire at you. Like they, I, I've seen video where it's like, you know, you hit somebody in the leg and they're still moving. They're still coming at you, you know? So that's yeah. why they're taught center mass. So it's, I get it. I definitely understand that, um, you know, we, we, at, at this time, we, you know, especially with George Floyd, with this trial being on right now, mm -hmm. we are, you know, we're on the police right now. But, you know, in this instance, as a black man, as a, uh, a advocate for social justice um, and, and, and social justice reform um, and, you know, changing the narrative of, of young black men. I mean, everything that I do, I looked at this footage and I did not feel how I felt with when I heard about Tamir Rice, let's say, for instance, you know, and Tamir mm -hmm. Rice was uh, the, you know, I think he was 12, 12 year, 12 -year -old, old playing kid, with the toy, playing with a toy gun mm -hmm. and came and got shot. This is different. This is different. This is, this is very different to me. And I think uh, it's an injustice, uh, you know, to our um, men and women of, of law enforcement to actually put this on them. That's my personal opinion. Now, was that kid really out to do anything malicious at that time? No, but he was being groomed to do so. Should he have died at that particular day, at that particular time? No, he really, really should not have. Should he have been out at 2.30 in the morning? No. Should he have had a better support system. Yes, that's a whole bunch of kids in a whole bunch of places all over the United States of America. However, that is when you're talking about when a cop who has the lethal force at his or her disposal, they have a duty to use that force discriminately. They have to be incredibly careful with that. And you see the kid, he turns around, he's trying to, you know, he's like, oops, it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. He was tossing his gun and like, hello, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. When he did that and he did like this, there should be a point where you go, eh. look, I'm, gl I'm glad the cop was sorry for what he did. Mm -hmm. Should he be fired? Yeah. Or should he at least be on desk duty? Yeah. Forever. I don't know. I just, I, you know, it's just, it's split section. It's split. It's, it's a split, split second. second. And division. you're supposed to be trained so for going, that. If I'm going here and I'm doing this all simultaneously, I have a 50 50 decision to make that this going up here is going to be a gun drop and not that. Right. So if you have made this decision here that it's not a gun, once it's here, you're dead. It's over with. So it's like, you know, the kid, I mean, there, there were multiple, there kid could have been running through the gun that way, be alive. Kid could have been running, stopped, dropped the gun, turn around. We'll He's 13. I understand. It's, a, it's well, like when you get building. busted, you're like, whoop, yeah. I didn't do anything. He's 13. So I, 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 but again, it's like, 
I, I agree. He's 13, and the visceral reaction is that he's 13. He's a kid. He mm-hmm. he doesn't know any better. But in that moment, it's you know I can't blame the officer for it. Like I, I have to blame everything else. Um, it's it's difficult. I will I won't say that the officer couldn't have, uh, have handled it in a different way, but I can't blame him. And if I was in that particular circumstance, and I'm you know worried about my life in in the alley. Uh, you know, I can't say that it's that it's different. It's it's you can always play Monday morning quarterback and right. say, "Hey, you should have did this. You should have did that." But in the heat of the battle, uh, that's difficult. George, uh, uh, Derek Chauvin, throw him under the jail. Right, the the killers for uh, for Philando Castile, he should get the chair. Right, you know, Alta Sterling, give him the chair. Like these people. Like this is pure maliciousness. This is pure, uh, just bigotry. And uh, to me, if those people were not black, they would be alive, right? If these victims were not black, they would be alive. So when it comes to that, for me, it's different. I just didn't feel that in this case, unfortunately. Okay, Pierre, we're gonna let you have your opinion. That's and right. well, guess what though? The cop me. is probably gonna be just fine because you do know that most officer involved shootings, they you generally will get a slap on the wrist. Like even with this much publicity around it, once you start to dig into the dirt of the case, he's probably going to get off with a slap on the wrist. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. I mean, we got so many other problems that are happening in our city, but that's to talk for another show. Yes, it um, is. You know, it's just, uh, and, and just the, on, the only other news I want to say, uh, you know, we, we lost the uh, icon in DMX um, recently, you know, God rest his soul, but addiction is real, man. Just addiction and, and mental health uh, are things that we need to take much more seriously, seriously as a society. Um, and just unfortunately, um, you know, when it was, when it was crack in the Reagan era, it mm-hmm. was, it was the finger point. It was, you know, throw them in jail, mm-hmm. those criminals, those convicts or what have you. Now, you know, when you talk about opioids and things that are affecting or impacting other communities, now we're being more empathetic of it. And it's a travesty um, because there are, there are people that are sitting in jail uh, still to this day for um, things that are illegal, that are illegal legal yeah, now. like marijuana um, possession like marijuana, exactly mm-hmm. um, so um you know we we as a society need to really take um you know addiction much more seriously and we need to take you know our mental health uh, much more seriously it's just a, a stigma on mental health especially in our black communities that um you know we need to really really get over this is true and speaking of opioids the entire reason that black people did not get affected by the opioid epidemic is because doctors don't believe we're in pain. So we were never prescribed opioids on the mass scale that other communities were. And this is the entire reason why we aren't suffering to that extent. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it, it's probably one of the reasons that people are paying a lot more attention to the opioid crisis because it did not affect us. It affected them. Right. And, uh, yeah, and that's you know that's that's a whole another topic. It's just as far as like there are studies that have shown that like you know, um, you know, black patients are leaving hospitals without you know pain medications because you know just physicians are not being sensitive uh, as far as um, prescribing pain medications for black folks. But it's uh, you know that yeah. happened to one of my patients, mm-hmm. and I always say, okay, she's gonna get Norco ibuprofen. I'm starting to add gabapentin because on the recommendation of a colleague, but I had a patient who was just sent home with ibuprofen. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. You know exactly what I do. I've been at that hospital a while. Everybody gets the same drugs. What were you thinking? And you know, with the new residents, you can't, you know, you have to be a little bit nice to them, but that was absolutely ridiculous. Why is that my patient? And you know why my patient got sent home with just ibuprofen? There you go. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Uh, and last but not least, uh, man, just the whole just talking about the the current COVID news. Um, you know, just last week we had um, Johnson and Johnson have uh, that was just basically put on halt um, because there was they six called it a patients, pause, Pierre. a pause, a timeout. 
So we had six patients out of six million plus that had blood clots. All right. So let's do the statistics on that. It's point oh 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 one some percent. Way to go with the math. Right. So it's just like um and to have all of these like anti vaxxer people, aha, I got you. Uh-huh. The hell you did. The hell you did. No, you did not. So like anybody that I stand behind everything that I have said about these vaccines, everything that I have said behind COVID, all of my push, there's absolutely nothing that I am changing. Right. So we're talking about, um, you know, three vaccines that were released. One of said vaccine has had a slightly higher incidence of blood clot, not sudden death. We're talking about that in comparison to COVID, where we have close to 600,000 people that are dead, right, from this disease that is killing people, right? The vaccine is working. If we're looking at the numbers from a just a, you know, men lie, women lie, numbers don't, right? If we're looking at it from that perspective, we're looking at the numbers start to trend downward. So when we're talking about vaccines and their efficacy, meaning their effectiveness on what's happening on our society around us, it's working, right? So do not get scared or do not get this, oh, aha, because they just put a pause on Johnson and Johnson because they had, you know, these few cases of blood clots. Because if we look at it, I guarantee you that anybody that has died from the vaccine, I mean, that has died from COVID would would kill to have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and take their blood clot and still be alive as opposed to getting COVID and getting ravished by this disease. Here, here. Um, I talk okay. to my patients all the time, every single, and I still have employees who will not get vaccinated. That's... Uh, yeah, and I'm I, I've, I'm still trying to wrap my head around why that's an issue, especially when we're dealing with these are young and healthy African American people, but they still have that stigma in their head that there's something that's going to cause infertility, or yeah, th- I think the biggest one so far is infertility or you know always going to mess with my breast milk or you know there's going to be something that happens to my baby and you're like your baby's not conceived so that's yeah um so that's that's my biggest issue and i try to explain to them about how vaccines work and how this is entirely a different vaccine than other vaccines and this is why it's so much better but it's falling on deaf ears and i'm starting to wonder what else i might be able to do to help this yeah, it's just, uh, uh, if I can't say it anymore, we're talking death and some of these side effects that you guys are talking about, right? Right. If we're talking, let's say, for instance, the infertility thing, which is not, it's right? not, it's been completely, it's been studied. Us as OBGYNs know that this is not the, not the case. We're talking about you not being able to have a baby or not being alive to even care for any type of baby. Right. When you're talking about actually getting this by and people say, Oh, I get it. And people got it and they got over it or whatever. That's fine. But when you talk about the two to 3% of people that actually get this thing and they die from it. Yeah. It's like, Russian roulette. That's Russian roulette. Everything is risk versus benefit. When you have something that has a higher risk and the benefit and it outweighs the benefit, then you don't do it. But when the benefit outweighs the risk, then absolutely. The reason why we can do a C-section and if it's a horizontal C-section around this way on the uterus, that will allow you to have another or at least attempt to have a vaginal delivery after it is because the risk of that incision coming open is very small. Right. However, when you cut the uterus up and down this way, we have a vertical incision and then you try to have a vaginal delivery. The risk are now three to four percent or even higher in some cases. So now the risk of it highly outweigh the benefit. So guess what? If you have a C-section that way, you cannot deliver. That's just an example. Right. The reason why you get into your car every day and you drive, though, Right. People are dying every day from car accidents. If you look at the number of people that are dying versus the people that are actually driving, you're talking point oh oh one percent. 
you know, very, very, it's old, a bunch of zeros with the number at the end of it of people that are dying. That's why it's okay to get into your car and drive. When you talk about going into a plane, getting in there and there may be one or two or three plane crashes that happen every year. So therefore, if you look at the whole number of, of people flying, it's extremely low. It's point oh, oh, whatever number you want to put at it. That's why we fly. But when you look at something that you're getting, that you can catch and you have a two to three percent chance of dying Death. or another five, six, seven, eight percent chance of having long term um, comorbidities, meaning, you know, small vessel disease. You may lose a limb. You may have, you know, severe uh, sclerotic lungs to where you may have to have breathing um, apparatuses and things to help you in the future. Heart disease. Right? Heart disease. When you have these things and now you're talking five, six, seven percent of people that are getting it are having long term issues. Long COVID. Yeah. The risk of that does not outweigh the benefit of the side effects from the uh, vaccine that you're talking about. They don't outweigh it. So now you need the vaccine. The vaccine makes much more sense because these risks are so, so high. Exactly. So I can't tell you any better than that. That is the best <sighs> I could break it down. Right. I've said that to nauseam, but geez. We're never going to reach herd immunity until we can get 75, 80% people vaccinated and until we can get everybody safe then nobody's going to be able to go anywhere nobody's going to be able to do anything and i say this look i got my pfizer times two because i want to be able to go back to a life that was even half normal just something and until everybody does this suck it up Get it done. I'm still alive. I got vaccinated in January. Oops, yeah. still here. Period. And guess what? They just said, hey, you got about six months, six to 12 months. You got to get another one. Guess right. what I'm going to do? I'm going to get another one. <laughs> give me. <laughs> give me fast. Give, me, give it. Give me two if I got to. Like, it Whatever. doesn't matter. Like, I am comfortable going out to the public and knowing that I am not going to die from this thing. Even if I do get it again, I am not going to die or being on a ventilator. I'm that comfortable to know that. That comfort and that level, that level of ease of your mind mm -hmm. is priceless. Right. So. I mean, I've known at least three people who've died yeah. from COVID. Absolutely. Somebody from my college class, yeah. Erica, died. Yeah, we both know. Wait, right. Rest Amazing peace. woman. Rest peace to her. Oh God. And she died from COVID. And when that, when you see people who's like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to get it because, and you know, people who have died, you do just kind of want to slap them upside the head. Oh, well, yeah. Well, we have, we have ranted enough. Ah, oh, that was what, great fun. What, what closing remarks do you have for the people? Maybe oh, closing arguments. Talk, yeah. Anything Ooh. you want to talk about? Oh, no, I, I, I got through. I got this is the most important thing I wanted to talk about. This is my friend. Um, masturbate. Don't forget. Don't forget to masturbate. Um, what else? <laughs> tell, the people, tell the people where they can find you. Oh, sure. You can find me at www.gynecologyinstitute.com. Uh, my Instagram is at Gynecology Institute. And um, of course, you know, Dr. P, the esteemed Dr. P, the fantastic Dr. P. So there we go. I'm done. Absolutely. So, uh, everybody, um, you know, this has been, you know, educational, I hope, and I hope entertaining. Um, we take women's health serious. We take, you know, black health seriously. Um, you know, so, you know, we joke and have fun and talk about things, but hopefully, uh, like any, any other, um, episode that I do, um, that I hope you got something out of it that I hope you, um, are enriched, edified, and can utilize, you know, some of these things that we're talking about, you know, for your own uh, personal health, because at the end of the day, we're dying at an alarming rate. Um, we're, you know, we're being impacted by our healthcare system um, disproportionately more than anyone else. And a lot of that has to do with education, right? It has to do with our knowledge and uh, understanding our options for healthcare, like really, you know, in a social media age, like don't have any questions about who's taking care of you. Like, don't be a, don't be afraid to uh, tap into their social media, right? To see who they are, what they're about, right? Don't don't be afraid to do that. Like, you as a check me, don't check everybody, right? Before you go see them and sit down and trust them with your life. Um, but uh, thanks for your attention. 
don't forget, um, you know, Doc for the Streets. Uh, check it out um, on uh, YouTube. And don't just look at it and like it. Subscribe to it. Um, I'll continue to uh, bring you this. All right. Love y'all. But you can't pull this off, right? Hey, you talking to the doctor.